I'm Ethan Brown. I'm a neurologist here at UCSF, specializing in, in movement disorders. I guess I say here, but I happen to be uh, in my basement, not actually at UCSF, but you know these days are a little different. Um, anyway, I see people with Parkinson's disease and related conditions. I have a particular interest in the microbiome and how it relates to Parkinson's disease and how the gastrointestinal tract in general relates to Parkinson's. So that's what we'll talk about today. Thanks so much for having me and thanks Rick for organizing all of this. Um, if I am, if I sound too quiet or anything, please let me know. I'm hoping that my mic works, but I have a microphone here if needed. So I will start with sharing my slides. And I, I think as Rick mentioned, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat. We'll certainly, I'll make sure to end at least 20 minutes before the hour um, to give time for enough questions. And anything I don't go over, we could go over more then if we want to. So let me share my screen. Hopefully this will work. Okay, can you all see those slides? Okay, great. So the first requisite of giving a microbiome talk is making some sort of pun about the gastrointestinal tract. More than a gut feeling tends to be one. And that I think is, I think that's what I would, is a good way to sum up uh, the feelings about Parkinson's disease in the microbiome. It's certainly more than a gut feeling. There's, there's, there's a lot uh, more distance to cover, as, as you'll find out from this talk, a lot more that we need to understand, but we, we think it's involved. And I'll tell you why. And, and hopefully another goal of these talks is to really see if we could get any practical you know, information out of this or actionable information um, out of, out of the, our, our understanding of the microbiome, even though it's really in its infancy. And another thing that I'm going to talk about is, is uh, a trial that we're doing at UCSF, where I'm the co-PI, that actually is trying to understand the relationship between the microbiome and the symptoms of Parkinson's disease, um, as well as some other studies that we're doing at UCSF, uh, some of which involve coming in and some of which are remote. So we'll talk about that in the end as well. Um, okay, so why look at the gastrointestinal system or the gut in Parkinson's disease in the first place? Well, the interest really comes from the fact that so many people have gastrointestinal symptoms as a part of Parkinson's disease. And not only is it pretty common, but it's very, very early. So many of you may know that there's this, you know, idea, and I'm sure that, you know, patients knew this a lot before us doctors, that before people were diagnosed with Parkinson's disease, a lot of times they experience uh, different types of symptoms, sometimes for years before the diagnosis. Um, in particular, these non-motor symptoms, so things like mood problems, sleep problems, loss of sense of smell, a lot of these issues can crop up years before someone comes in with a tremor or with stiffness. And constipation uh, or other gastrointestinal problems, but constipation is the most common, tends to be among the earliest and can really happen even decades before um, anyone develops, you know, the stiffness or, or tremor that brings them into a doctor's office and gets them a diagnosis of Parkinson's. So there's actually some thought that, you know, certainly the gut seems to be pretty involved. And what if it's really a core part of the disease or even, even where Parkinson's disease starts? Um, they've done studies that have actually found alpha-synuclein, which is the abnormal, uh, you know, the protein that we think is one of the main uh, drivers of dysfunction in Parkinson's disease is abnormal aggregation of this protein called alpha-synuclein. And they've found alpha-synuclein in the neurons inside the gastrointestinal tract, in some cases, many years before anyone actually develops the, the motor symptoms of Parkinson's. So one question and one theory that's been postulated for a while is that could Parkinson's actually start in the gut and somehow spread into the brain? Not all evidence is completely supportive of that, I should say. It's also possible that it goes the other way and that the gut just happens to be a bystander of Parkinson's disease and that there's another possibility that you know, gut problems could still cause inflammation and that can worsen a lot of the symptoms of Parkinson's or even progression in Parkinson's. Um, regardless, it seems that track is really a part of the, of, of the Parkinson's disease condition. And gone are the days when we think of this as just a motor disorder. And really, people have started more and more to think about it as a um, systemic condition that involves many different organs. 
But the question is, if we could somehow treat problems of the gut, could we help other problems of Parkinson's disease? Okay, so we think the gut's involved, but why the microbiome now? So it turns out that you have a lot of stowaways in your gut that are not your own cells. Um, in fact, over in and over your whole body are different organisms, mostly bacteria, but also viruses and parasites and fungi um, that are not your own and have come along for the ride. Um, in fact, just as many cells that are in your body, and in, in some estimates, 10 times more the number of cells that you have in your body are actually from other organisms. So most of your cells that you're walking around with are not your own, but are bacteria and other types of organisms. There are a lot of different types of species, thousands of different types of species in one person. And it turns out that they do a lot for us. In the gut alone, we think that they help with um, the promotion of motility. So making sure that the gastrointestinal tract keeps moving. We think they help with the development of the epithelium, which is the barrier of the gastrointestinal tract between what's essentially the outside world, even though it's inside. So between food and other things that you swallow and the rest of your body. So we think that bacteria help keep that barrier really tight. We think that they help prime the immune system. So your immune system is constantly fighting off, you know, other types of bad bacteria. And we think that, that the bacteria that live on your body kind of help develop that. And we think that they're really important for digestion of food, um, for providing some types of vitamins that our own cells can't provide and probably for digestions of some medications and for the efficacy of some medication. So we'll talk about that a lot too, but we really rely on them in, in a lot of different ways. However, more and more we're realizing that the dysfunction of the microbiome or dysbiosis can also lead to problems in disease. People are very interested in this with obesity, with diabetes, with cardiovascular disease, and more and more people are interested in, in neurology. Turns out that there are a lot of different ways that abnormal bacteria or abnormal organisms in the gut can communicate to the brain. There are direct connections between the brain and the gastrointestinal tract, like the vagus nerve. And then there are indirect ways, causing inflammation, secreting hormones, where the gut can talk to the brain. This communication is known as the gut-brain axis. And people are very interested in multiple sclerosis, Alzheimer's disease, ALS, and also especially in Parkinson's, because as I said, the gut plays such a prominent role in people's symptoms. How does abnormalities of the gut relate to the brain and cause brain problems? So it turns out if you look at the bacteria in the stool of people with Parkinson's disease, it is different than the bacteria of people without. So the bacteria that is in the gut of people with Parkinson's is different than people without Parkinson's disease. There have been many, many studies that have shown that um, now at this point. They're not always consistent differences. And the question is, what do we do with these differences? So for instance, people are saying, well, you know, there are some studies that say that there are less bacteria that produce something called short chain fatty acids, which are kind of like vitamins. They're chemicals that bacteria produce that in some cases help reduce inflammation. Or could it be that, you know, some studies show that the bacteria that are reduced in Parkinson's cause a leakier gut. So without the bacteria keeping the cells tight, the gut in people with Parkinson's is a little leaky and that can lead to more systemic inflammation and that can lead to more problems in the brain. These are all theories that are still being postulated. Um, it's gonna take a little bit of time to figure it out. Uh, uh, for instance, you know, here is a very early study that found that a particular bacteria called Prevotella um, was reduced in people with Parkinson's. So everyone thought that was the signature finding. But then there were other studies that showed that that's not always the case. Sometimes Prevotella is not shown. And it's not that simple. For instance, you know, this other bug called Acromantia, and I tried to leave out as many bug names as I can because I, have, I only left in the ones that I could clearly pronounce. The other ones I, I have a lot of difficulty with. Um, there are some studies that showed that Acromantia, which is a bacteria, is increased in people's gut and people with Parkinson's. So maybe that's the problem. Maybe we need an antibiotic that can get rid of acromancia. But if you Google acromancia, most people are fans of acromancia. I found this about it being a friendly bacterium who cares. So, 
you know, in a lot of conditions, it turns out acromantia is actually anti-inflammatory and strengthens the gut. So maybe an increased acromantia in people with Parkinson's is in response to something else that's going on, and it's your bacteria trying to help you. So maybe the dysbiosis in Parkinson's is actually compensation for some other problem. It's very complex, and it turns out there are a huge number of factors that affect the microbiome. Um, everything from obviously medications, antibiotics, exercise, other medical problems, diet, um, you know, uh, 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 the type of environment you're in, how often you go outside, whether or not you have a pet, how many people you live with, so many different things that can affect the microbiome in Parkinson's in any condition, really. And a lot of these things are different in people with Parkinson's. So people with Parkinson's might move around less than people with um, without. People with Parkinson's might pay attention to their diet. People with Parkinson's might be less likely to smoke or less likely to you know, uh, uh, do other different types of activities that might change your microbiome. So really understanding this and understanding why there are differences between groups is, is very complicated. And it shows how really how much we have, have to learn and how much we have to understand about the microbiome um, before we can jump to any, any huge conclusions off of the studies. But, you know, there are important ways that I think we can change the microbiome in, in important and practical ways. Some of these are things that you've probably heard before are good. We're just realizing that maybe the ways that they're good are really changing the bacteria in the gut. And maybe this, you know, provides other ways to measure whether or not they're having a good effect in the future. So I'm going to just spend a little bit of time on kind of what I've concluded are probably good things from looking at, you know, microbiome research, good things to recommend. And really some of the only things that I can recommend um, at this point, of, uh, at this stage. Um, so first of all, diet. So the single most effective way to improve the, the, you know, flora, the bacteria that are in your gastrointestinal system is changing your diet. And that's come from animal studies that show that, you know, real immediate change happens if you change people's diet, if you change animals diets, and it's also consistent with human studies. Um, you know, what diet is good for Parkinson's is, is a big question that I have. And, you know, protein issues aside, which I won't touch on too much because there's a you know particular issue there that many people may know with protein and levodopa. But in general, the diet that we seem to seems to be beneficial for a lot of people. Um, uh, you know, in, in standard recommendations for for the diet really seem to be good for people with Parkinson's. And these, you know, more and more we're looking at things like the Mediterranean diet, um, where you should increase whole grains, fish vegetables, beans, and really try to limit things like red meat or full fat dairy or, or other types of meats. Um, so this is, I'm not going to dwell too much on the specifics of the Mediterranean diet. It's pretty easy to find through books, online resources, or nutritionists. Another similar one is the mind diet. And by the way, I could, I'm also happy to share these slides afterwards, uh, Rick, if that's possible. Um, the, okay, great. So don't worry too much about the screenshots or notes. Um, the mind diet is another diet that is very similar to the Mediterranean diet, thought to be um, uh, maybe better for neurologic conditions just because it includes things like berries, which have antioxidants. There's not really great evidence for that. I should say, stepping back, that while I don't fully endorse any of these diets in particular, um, and the science behind them is some is very challenging and sometimes not super strong because, you know, the people that are willing to go through trials for diets are usually a different type of, uh, of people and maybe have a lot of other factors that affect their outcomes. However, you know, sometimes it's helpful to hear about a named diet so that you can actually follow something or follow ingredients or get the right type of book. Anyway, the MIND diet is, is another one that's very similar to the Mediterranean diet and does have some evidence. So there have been a few studies now First of all, in the general population, the MIND diet seems to be associated with a lower risk of dementia. And then there is recently a randomized control trial where they randomized people to the MIND diet versus a normal diet in people with Parkinson's disease. And the people who had the MIND diet had a very reduced um, or had better uh, cognitive testing, so a better neuropsychiatric testing than the people without. Again, there are a lot of factors that go into this. 
people might feel better emotionally on it. Cardiovascular health might be better, but you know, from, from what I understand of the microbiome, I think that it's probably a, 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 you know, diet. I'm more interested now than I used to be in terms of the diet, um, as a, it should be part of the focus in terms of our non-pharmacologic approach to treating Parkinson's. Um, I will say too that in people who are uh, the people who are ascribed to the mind diet and the Mediterranean diet have a lower likelihood of developing Parkinson's disease um, in some large studies, which again might show you know how it can potentially even slow. You know, there's no evidence in particular about slowing disease, but might suggest something like that in the future. So more studies to come for this, but I think it's safe to subscribe to something like that. I get a lot of questions about probiotics. Again, if they're abnormal bacteria, why don't we just replenish it with new bacteria? That it's good, so-called good. So probiotics are a little problematic for a number of reasons. Um, you know, first of all, we're not completely sure how effective probiotics are at restoring a healthy microbiome in the gut. A lot of probiotics, a lot of the bacteria probiotics might just get digested in the stomach, might not even make it down to the, to the intestine in the first place. And then, you know, in a lot of cases, in order to really restore the bacteria, you might have to take a huge amount of probiotics to really make it effective. A lot of people now are more interested in what is termed prebiotics, which is really just diet changes that enhance the, the good bacterial population in the gut. But there is some evidence for probiotics in Parkinson's disease, namely in improving, uh, for the first of all, in mouse models Parkinson's disease, it seems to reduce inflammation. In people with Parkinson's disease, there have been a couple randomized trials now that show that it, it, it can be helpful for constipation. Um, and this is even in people that have somewhat severe constipation in one of the studies. Um, it really can be helpful for increasing uh, the uh, spontaneous, the, the number of bowel movements someone has regularly. Which brings me to constipation. Constipation is also, I think, a very important thing to manage. And, it's, you know, obviously constipation is a huge issue for many people with Parkinson's, not everyone, but for many people. And sometimes it's just, you know, noticeable and something that people deal with. And sometimes it can be very severe, even leading to hospitalization. Um, so just in addition to discomfort though, you know, more people are realizing that constipation itself can change the microbiome. It's probably affected by the microbiome, but can also worsen it, you know, slowing things and not flushing things out in a regular way. Um, is maybe making the population of the microbiome different, allowing different types of bacteria to grow. So I've, be, I've become convinced that constipation is probably an important thing to try to manage, even if it's not particularly bothersome or your tolerance for waiting for a long time um, is, is particularly high. I think it's probably a good thing to always keep in mind and, and, and you know, try to, to make sure that bowel movements are regular and, and frequent. Um, there are a lot of different strategies for treating constipation. I'm not going to go into them, but I will say that non-pharmacologic strategies are always the way to start. And some pearls are things like high fiber is great, um, but hydration is very important if high fiber is part of it. Prunes, lots of prunes is fantastic and also whole grains. And then exercise, I think, is an underappreciated factor that can help um, with, with constipation in some cases. And then finally, obviously, you know, medications, stool softeners, motility agents, laxatives. So talking to your physician about that, making sure to bring it up with your Parkinson's disease physician or neurologist if it is a problem. And then I had to put something in on stool transplant, although I left out the picture because I thought it was most appropriate. But a lot of people have questions about stool transplant because this is, the, you know, this should be the ultimate fix of the microbiome. How do we replace, how do we fix the abnormal bacteria in the gut? We administer a healthy bacteria. So this is the procedure where you take the stool from a healthy person or someone without a problem, I should say. So someone maybe without Parkinson's disease, although the donor who you take that stool from is a big question and still trying to be understood just as a small aside. Um, and then you transplant it into someone with a condition. So this is a, a now a, a routine, I shouldn't say routine, but it's a not uncommon medical practice to treat some antibiotic resistant bacteria in particularly C. difficile that can cause diarrhea and be resistant to antibiotics. You can replace the stool. It can be administered either through a colonoscopy, a nasogastric tube, 
which is a tube that goes through the nose and down through the stomach, um, or oral capsules actually, um, that people take a large amount of and are kind of time release. So they don't release until they get into the intestine. Um, a lot of questions remain though within Parkinson's disease. What are we treating? How are we treating it? Who's the right type of donor? Um, you know, how long does it stay? There have been some studies though, just recently there was a very a small, so 10 people open label study that looked at stool transplant through colonoscopy and nasogastric tube and people reported improvement in motor and non-motor system symptoms. You know, I will just give a caveat, I don't know, all open label studies in people with Parkinson's disease tend to show benefit. The placebo effect is, is very, very strong. And for something like this, which is a big, you know, procedure, um, it's very strong. So, you know, I think it's, it's, there have been many treatments in Parkinson's that have looked good from an open label where they don't have a placebo. Um, and then, you know, end up really not holding as much water when they, when they try it in a different way. So something to definitely keep an eye on. Um, but I don't think, certainly don't think it's ready for, for prime time yet. Understanding who's the right patient again, even within Parkinson's disease, there's a huge, as everyone knows, there's a huge amount of variability. So understanding who's the right person for this and how it's really going to address and what it's going to improve. I think we're still a little ways from that, but it's certainly on the horizon, which is exciting. And then what about antibiotics? So antibiotics are an interesting, you know, they're obviously we're a lot more careful with antibiotics these days. So people are wary of them, which is good because I think that they've been overused in the past. But do they have a role? I mean, it is the way that we tend to get rid of bacteria. Um, they can have a huge effect on the microbiome, a lot of times an unwanted effect on the microbiome. When we take antibiotics for another reason, um, they usually, they, certain antibiotics can have a really long lasting and very broad effect on the microbiome in the gut. Um, but there have been some evidence in the past that maybe treating certain bacteria in the gut with, with, with antibiotics can help the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. So these come from old studies looking at H. pylori, which causes peptic ulcer disease. Um, treating that, if someone has it, can maybe improve some of the symptoms of Parkinson's, and we think that might be through absorption of the medication. There's also this condition known as uh, SIBO, or small intestinal bowel overgrowth. And um, that's a condition where we think there's an abnormal overgrowth of certain types of bacteria in the intestine, where they shouldn't be in the small intestine. That's a difficult diagnosis to, uh, to make in some cases. Um, and it's kind of not as common as it used to be just because it's so challenging to make, but there has been a small study, again, open label, where treating people with SIBO and rifaximin seem to improve people's on time. In other words, the effect of the levodopa um, after there was treated. So there was a question about whether or not that improved absorption. We're very interested in this question in particular because one of the scientists at UCSF has discovered a bacteria that's in the gut that um, is very, uh, seems to metabolize levodopa. Um, now, we always knew, or since the 70s, people have known that bacteria is probably involved in, the metabolis in, the, in metabolizing levodopa. They did an experiment a long time ago where they gave people with Parkinson's antibiotics and their metabolism of levodopa changed. But until recent uh, technology developed, we weren't really able to specify which bacteria those were. And it's been very recently in the last couple of years that, as I said, our, one of our scientists here and then a, another scientist at another institution also found this, that there are two bugs in the intestine that metabolize levodopa and are not inhibited by carbidopa. So they metabolize it the same way as our bodies do. And we give carbidopa to slow that metabolism, but carbidopa doesn't work for these bacteria. And the levodopa seems to uh, be metabolized by this bug in the gut. It, there was also a study that found that this bug was more frequent in people who had had Parkinson's for a long time. But so the question is, is this bacteria getting in the way of us delivering levodopa into the system of people with Parkinson's disease? In other words, is the bug metabolizing it so that people with Parkinson's can't use it? Um, hold on just one second. I'm sorry. The, okay, so, so that's still an open question. And it's one of the questions that we're particularly interested in. As I said, there are 
a lot of questions that we have about the microbiome. And, um, but this is one of them that we feel like is a little bit one that is a good one to start to answer. That is a little bit, um, easier to answer in some senses and will probably reveal a lot about how the microbiome relates to people with Parkinson's in a more general sense. So this is the study that we are doing at UCSF. And again, I say at UCSF, although this is actually a fully remote study at this point. So the questions we have are, okay, does not, we kind of started small with our questions and also include big. So does an abnormal microbiome in people with Parkinson's disease contribute to medication failures or other side effects of levodopa? As many people know, levodopa is a fantastic medication. It can help symptoms a lot, It's very effective, but over time it can cause more complications or you can have so-called dose failures or, mo or fluctuations where people develop more and more off time as the levodopa um, fails over time. Is the microbiome contributing to that? Is this particular bug increasing and taking up too much of the levodopa before it can get into people's system? That's one big question do we have. But we're also interested, does an abnormal microbiome in people with Parkinson's disease relate to symptoms or systemic signs of inflammation? Is the microbiome causing inflammation and by treating it, so do we reset the microbiome by treating it and can we reduce that inflammation or improve the medication failures that we're seeing with levodopa? These are a lot of the questions that we have. So what we're doing is we're looking for people with Parkinson's disease who are on carbidopa levodopa with at least some motor fluctuations. So at least sometimes when the levodopa is wearing off and their, motor, and their symptoms are coming back. And we're asking people to come in and we're asking for stool samples and urine samples, um, as well as a diary reporting their um, motor symptoms. And sorry, I, again, I see I'm so used to this. I said, we're asking people to come in, but in the setting of the COVID pandemic, we actually made this a fully remote study. So people now do this fully from their home. Um, at each study visit, we evaluate the effect of levodopa by an on-off test. And then what we do is we're using a medication called rifaximin, which is an antibiotic that stays completely within the gut and doesn't have these broad changes on the microbiome that we see with other antibiotics. We think it only changes a few bacteria. And one of the bacteria that we think it changes is this bacteria that does the metabolism of levodopa. So can we target this bacteria that's metabolizing levodopa with this medication and improve fluctuations? And can we also improve kind of systemic inflammation? So that this is what we're looking for in the micro PD trial. Um, hopefully it'll allow us not only to learn about the relationship between the microbiome and medication metabolism in Parkinson's disease, but also about inflammation in general. So more, hopefully more to come about this as, you know, as, as we get more and more results, but it is actively enrolling. So if anyone in particular is interested or knows anyone that may be interested, then um, definitely let me know. As I said, um, it does involve taking a medication or a study drug or a placebo. We think it's very safe, but we can talk to you more about that. Um, and then it, otherwise it's all uh, done remotely. So all done from one's home through both telemedicine and um, and that type of that type of thing. So Danilo Romero is our is our contact person on that. And um, before I stop, because I want to give everyone an opportunity for questions about the microbiome in general, I do want to mention that we have other studies at UCSF that are going on. Some of these are in person. So the Spark study is looking at physical activity to slow Parkinson's disease progression. The Neuroderm study is looking at it's similar to our study that's looking at fluctuations in Parkinson's. This is actually testing a, a pump that people wear um, that can give provide subcutaneous infusion of levodopa throughout the day to try to steady out those motor fluctuations in addition to medication. And then we're enrolling people for the Parkinson's Progression Marker Initiative, uh, which is a huge observational study, PPMI, that we've learned a lot from. Um, and we are re-enrolling, so we're newly enrolling people. Some of these, the PPMI study and the SPARC study are for people that are newly diagnosed with Parkinson's for right now, although may involve others. There's also uh, going to be an online component of the PPMI study.
that's for everyone with Parkinson's. And then the other study that we're very excited about is a study called Topaz. So just briefly about this, this is um, people with Parkinson's disease have a higher risk of fracture and actually a lower treatment for osteoporosis, which is a condition that involves low bone density. And there's some suggestion that people for Parkinson's, people with Parkinson's disease have lower bone density. So uh, the treatment for um, uh, uh, osteoporosis is a well-known treatment called zelendronate. Um, it's a bisphosphonate medication, uh, which involves just a single infusion and can last for many years. So our question is, can we prevent fractures in people with Parkinson's? which are associated with very significant um, you know, complications. And we prevent fractures in people with Parkinson's that are uh, with just one dose of zelendronate, just one infusion. So this is another remote study for anyone with Parkinson's disease or related conditions, not just Parkinson's, but we're looking at PSP, MSA, um, LBD, uh, 60, who are 60 and older. Um, and, um, are not already on, I should say, you know, Zalendronate or a similar medication. This is also a fully remote study. A uh, traveling nurse kind of comes into the home to give uh, the study drug and that's it. That's the only actual intervention. So if people are interested in this study as well, um, then let us know. I can share these flyers and this information also. But another contact, again, would be Danilo Romero would be the best contact. If you're interested in being on a list for any type of research, you know, I understand that research is sometimes a big commitment. Um, we are just so grateful to the Parkinson's community for how, uh, you know, interested and enthusiastic people are about research. And, um, and we've been learning so much and really, really just want to let people know that we're still able to provide research opportunities, even remotely in these, in these challenging times. Um, that is all I have. Um, uh, this is our department. So we, we thank you very much for all of your interest. Again, thank you for having me. And i um, very happy to talk about anything else that people are interested in or answer any questions. Well, that's fabulous. Uh, thank you so much, Ethan. So we're now going to enter the question and answer phase of the presentation. So Ethan, one of the things I'll ask for, of you is that you Maybe stop sharing your screen so that we can see you as people ask questions. Of course. We'll go through the questions that people chatted in first, and then there'll be ample time for you to ask them in person. When you ask your question, simply unmute yourself. And the simple rule of the road is don't talk all for each other. All right. So is there in a, here's uh, one of the first questions that came in. It's if we rely on the bacteria in our body for various reasons, are things like antibiotics, antibacterial sanitizers, and vaccines thought to be detrimental for a healthy microbiome? Yeah, that's a great question. So first of all, I'll say vaccines, probably not. So vaccines are, um, you know, vaccines are very targeted treatments mostly for viruses. The overwhelming number of organisms in and on your body that we think have an important effect are uh, bacteria. There are viruses, so the vaccines won't affect those at all. The viruses, you know, there are more and more people that are interested in how viruses play in. Um, so there may be some, but the vaccines that are given are so targeted that they're really just targeting the you know, abnormal viruses, you know, like coronavirus that are really causing uh, problems. So um, I would say that for that, you know, I wouldn't have any concerns about that. Antibiotics, you know, I will say that, it, so if you're being prescribed antibiotics for a clear reason, and a, um, then it's a good idea to do it. Um, usually there's always a risk benefit so if you're actually sick with a bacterial intra in infection, then you should definitely take the antibiotics that are prescribed. Antibiotics are fantastic drugs and they've saved a lot of lives. Um, there are, you know, there are some studies that suggest that they might change the microbiome. And there are some people that if they develop, you know, diarrhea afterwards or some other problems, you may be asked to take something like a probiotic 
um, after the antibiotic. Um, but in most cases, I think it's, it's not an issue. But what this microbiome research has made us realize is that we shouldn't be using antibiotics if we don't need them. Um, I think in the past, doctors were very quick to prescribe antibiotics for um, you know, things that probably weren't real bacterial infections. I think now people have a lot better um, antibiotic stewardship, as you will. So if, you're, if anyone recommends an antibiotic for you, I would, I would definitely take it. And then again, in terms of you know, antibacterial soaps and Purell and wipes, I think it's probably a good idea to keep doing those. And I don't think that those make a, a huge change in terms of our you know, bacterial structure. I think certainly avoiding getting sick is a good idea. You know, there's some that argue that we shouldn't be overdoing it, but I will say that in these days, when we're very worried about things like the coronavirus infection or other types of infections, I think that's a good idea, and I don't think it's having that much of an untoward effect on our, um, on our, you know, bacterial or our gut flora. Here's another question for you, Ethan. Our pre, and I think you may have you did touch on this. Are pre or probiotics useful in Parkinson's disease? Yeah, I touched on that a little bit. So, um, probiotics. There have been a few studies in probiotics. And the only evidence that we have right now says that they're helpful for constipation. So those are two randomized studies, one from about 10 years ago and one from just last year that shows that some probiotic mixtures help with constipation and Parkinson's. Um, there, I should say there was one small study that you know showed an overall reduction in some scores that we use, but it, that study didn't really provide enough details to tell us either way. So right now we can say probiotics might be a good option for someone with constipation and Parkinson's. Um, prebiotics, I think are really interesting. We don't know as much about how prebiotics affect Parkinson's. Prebiotics are essentially, you know, uh, dietary foods, things like that are high in fiber or, you know, other things like onions, chicory root, I think is listed. You can Google them again, that are essentially thought to be food for a healthy bacteria. And I, I am a believer in, in using those, although there's not evidence right now that prebiotics are particularly helpful in Parkinson's. But I think using them as part of your diet, which you can do by increasing fiber in your diet, may be helpful. Okay, here's another question. Is there an association between forms of inflammatory bowel disease and Parkinson's? And has this been looked into in terms of the presence of abnormal alpha-synuclein in the nerves of the gut, et cetera, in inflammatory bowel disease? Yeah, that's a great question. So yes, there are studies that show, there are several studies that show that there's an association between types of inflammatory bowel disease. Um, I think that, you know, if you're looking at specific types, there might be a slightly higher association with Crohn's and, and still some in UC, but not as consistent. We'll say that, you know, those studies have some flaws in that it's, you know, there, there are, you know, could it be the inflammatory bowel disease itself, the medications, could it just be the fact that those people are coming to the hospital more, so maybe they're more likely to be diagnosed with Parkinson's. There are some questions in that because it's not um, always found. There are other studies that have not found it. But there is some suggestion that there's an association between inflammatory bowel disease and Parkinson's. And there's certainly basic science data to show that inflammation can, in the gut, can worsen alpha-synuclein aggregation in the neurons of the gut. And maybe that can lead to, you know, more aggregation, which can then lead to more propagation. So that's certainly one theory that inflammation in the gut can start this kind of cascade. But so far, that data doesn't really exist in people with uh, in people with Parkinson's disease. So while it's possible, it's not necessarily, you know, how it's happening, but it's a very interesting, um, you know, uh, hypothesis that needs more study. Here's the next question. Is a microbiome test useful? Yeah, that's a great question. So there are some, yeah, oh, you know, just like there are direct to consumer genetic tests, you can, you can genotype your, your stool. Um, I would say no right now. I mean, I don't know how I would use it and I don't know how I would recommend someone else to use it. I will say I'm not super familiar because I haven't had any patients that do it with the output that you get. Um, I would expect the most it can tell you to do is, you know, certain healthy 
behaviors anyway, like changing your diet or exercising or stopping smoking or something else. Um, I, w- I would say for now, we just don't know enough to make that particularly useful to get, you know, a, a readout of your own microbiome. But again, I'm not aware of the actual results that you get. So hopefully you hear more. Okay, here's a, a question. I don't know what category to put it in, but it says, what is social jet lag? Oh, you know, <laughs> you know what? I have to say, I saw that on my slide last night and I was like, I should get rid of that. I'm not sure exactly what that is. That is very, <laughs> you guys were paying a lot of attention. <laughs> that is very great. I think that might've been a typo that um, like social interactions or even jet lag can do it, but <laughs> If whoever that was that asked that wants to email me, I'm going to try to find out in that original paper. And I can <laughs> I'm glad that was, that was a little thing I put in there just to make sure people were paying attention. That's great. <laughs> okay, this is, we've run through the pre-recorded questions for the most part. If you have questions now, you can ask them out loud. You have to simply unmute yourself. And the only request is that you don't talk over each other. Are there any questions? Coming. Okay, Ian. I have a question about uh, herbal response to Parkinson's. Uh, lion's mane. You familiar with lion's mane at all? So it's a mushroom. Yeah, you know, I I am. Well, I know I know that it's a mushroom, but beyond that, I don't know much else. I'm actually not aware of. Well, I would say in general, you know the. There aren't any, you know, truly, you know, in terms of supplements and herbal supplements and other types of supplements, we haven't found anything that can, you know, benefit people with Parkinson's in particular. Um, but I'm not aware of the literature about lion's mane. So I'd have to defer that one. It's a good question. Thank you. Go ahead, Derek. I had uh, Derek Ransley with his hand up. Uh, I, I was interested in how you measure success and failure in your studies. You mean in people with Parkinson's? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't know if this is the answer to your question, but I think that's a great, if I understand what you mean, it's a great question. I think that um, there's a lot of discussion in the Parkinson's research community in general about what outcome to look for in people with Parkinson's because sometimes the things that we choose are not necessarily things that people care about. Um, So, and I think it can be different for different people. In my particular study, the study that we're doing with the microbiome, we're looking at people that are having dose failures from the levodopa. So we're looking at increasing the benefit of levodopa, whatever that means for people. Some people have tremor that comes up. Some people have stiffness or difficulty walking that, you know, several hours a day. So we're interested in reducing the amount of time that their meds are not working. That's what we're looking at. We're also looking at other things like inflammatory markers, you know, non-motor symptoms, things like depression, autonomic problems. But that's the main issue that we're looking at. But that is a good question because, um, you know, it's kind of one of active discussion in, in Parkinson's world. And I will say that we're trying to involve more and more patients in those discussions to really help us choose good outcomes. Uh, Here's another question. This one is from me. I've heard from physical therapists and others that the use of carbonated water when taking levodopa may help absorption. And I wondered, does carbonated, do carbonated uh, beverages help or disturb the gut, uh, Mm. the microbiome? I'm going to have to look into that. I have not heard of that either for absorption or for microbiome changes. It's not one that I've seen that, you know, has been well studied at least, or it's not a big effect, but I haven't looked into that particular. I I actually don't know the answer to that. And for absorption, that's interesting. Yeah, I'm not sure. Okay, it's time for the next person who would like to ask a question. We have actually 46 participants who are here on now, Dr. Brown, so. That's great. I have a question. Uh, Um, Go ahead. 
when you talk about the gut microbiome, are you talking essentially about the large bowel in location or or does you include the from the mouth to the anus? Yeah, that's a that's a fantastic question. And another reason that I didn't get into um, you know, why these microbiome studies are so hard to interpret is because of differences in methodology, where they may be sampling, how they're storing it, how they're processing it. So I should say back to the direct to consumer, should I measure my microbiome? You know, there are going to be lab people that argue with you about how they do it. Is that the right way, et cetera. Anyway, um, most of the, most of the studies are off of stool samples, including ours. Most of the stool samples probably come from bacteria in the colon. And most, the highest, the most number of bugs are in the colon, so the large intestine. Um, does that represent those in the small intestine? Maybe. There's probably a different population. So you have less and less bacteria as you go up from colon to small intestine to stomach to esophagus. And then again, you have a lot in the mouth. Um, and that's just because of the nature of the stomach. So, you know, the best way would be to do a colonoscopy and actually sample from the small intestine, but we can't do that in everyone. So most of the studies are based on the colon and we try to interpret from there, but it is an important limitation, especially because for instance, the absorption of levodopa happens in the small intestine. So we're really more interested in the bugs there. And that's where rifaximin is um, most active, we think. Right. So to try to answer your question again, most of our sample is probably from the colon. We think that's somewhat representative of the small intestine also, but probably not exactly. Thank you. Sure. Uh, Abraham, you have your hand up. Uh, you have to unmute yourself, Abraham. Thanks, Dr. Brown, for your presentation. <clears throat> My question is, uh, after you have done a change, whether with the Mediterranean diet or, or other remedies, how long does the microbiome take? How long does it take to change the flora? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, we don't fully know, but there are some studies that show it can be pretty fast. I mean, depending on how much you change your diet. But diet is probably one of the fastest ways. But I would say it can even be within days to weeks if you really, you know, remarkably change a diet. Now, if you're eating pretty healthy anyway and you change to the, um, uh, you know, Mediterranean diet, it's not a huge change, then it might take longer or it might not be as dramatic. But there have been some studies that show that even, you know, days to a week or so, it can be that quick. And is it okay to continue taking supplements like vitamins and other stuff with, with such a change? Yeah, I didn't really get into vitamins or supplements too much, but you know, for the most part, I would say um, vitamins and supplements are probably okay to be taking. And there are certain physicians even that recommend taking certain things like coenzyme Q12, you know, that, that think that, well, the studies that didn't show a great effect, maybe, you know, maybe there was a little bit of a signal and it's worth taking. Um, and then there are certain reports that people with Parkinson's might be low in vitamin D or vitamin B12. Certainly if you're low in these things, it is worthwhile to take it. But yeah, in terms of the diet change, there doesn't seem to really be a detriment um, to taking the vitamins. Thank you. For the most part, there are specific supplements that, you know, may be problematic, but for the most part, many of them are not too problematic. And you can always review them with your physician if you have particular concerns. Okay. Uh, Marianne, uh, you have, uh, unmute yourself and you can ask a question. Go ahead. Doctor, could you give us the dosage of probiotic as it relates to constipation? Yeah, that's a great question. So. The, the strain that they used was actually in the study was actually a pretty specific strain. So finding the right type of probiotic is the next challenge. Um, and the dose would change with, um, with the specific type of probiotic used and probably would be the one that's recommended on the bottle. 
Um, the type of probiotic that they use was a multi-strain probiotic. So if you are looking for a probiotic, you can look for ones with um, really a large number of bacteria in it. Usually the, you know, uh, lacnose spiraceae or the bacteria, you know, spiraceae, I told you I was not great at pronouncing these, um, <laughs> are the most common. Um, they, uh, you know, that there's some suggestion that maybe those are the ones that, that can be helpful. And then the dosage that's recommended, um, although, you know, in some cases it might be, you might need something higher. Thank you. I have a question. Uh, do vibrating plates help with balance and Parkinson's? Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not as familiar with that. Is that um, something that you do with physical therapy or? Yeah, we go to a place where, um, actually we go to a place where uh, they do high voltage electrodes on our feet and our legs. Hmm. And then they can do it on my husband's uh, shoulders. Yeah, and just wondering if if there's any um, any studies that show that that helps Parkinson's. That's a good question, and I'm not I'm not sure. I would think that if it if it's like shaking, so that you have to keep your balance, maybe. But I'm not sure about just high voltage okay. uh, activity. Yeah, I haven't heard any of it. Okay, thank you. So that's the use of anti-inflammatories. Uh, and you know, such as Advil, et cetera, have any effect on uh, Parkinson's in general or on the microbiome? It's a good question. I don't know of I'm sure that they can have an effect on the microbiome, but i don't I don't know of any large effect offhand. And I'd have to look into that more. Um, there are some studies that you know suggest maybe a benefit in, well, I should say, there's one study that was recently done from someone in our group who looked at people with LARC2, so with a particular genetic mutation for Parkinson's, and people who took anti-inflammatories with the genetic mutation were less likely to have Parkinson's. So there's a question out there of, could it be protective of Parkinson's um, you know, in people that are at risk, or at least in certain genetic subtypes of Parkinson's. So I think there, there's some interest in that, whether or not that acts through the microbiome, I think is unclear. Um, inflammation probably plays a role in Parkinson's. We're still trying to understand what, and then the question is, are, you know, over the counter anti-inflammatories, the right type of anti-inflammatory for the inflammation. So it's still an open question. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Abraham, you had your hand up. Yeah. Dr. Brown, a quick question mm -hmm. about Acidophilus thermophilus. Uh, how how good that is by itself, and while one is considering to change the microbiome. I don't know if I'm familiar. Is this one that's used in a probiotic? Right. You usually in, in, there is milk, Acidophilus thermophilus in, uh, within the milk. Mm -hmm. and it helps, supposed to help with the digestion and all that. Yeah. This might be one of the other types of bacteria that are, I think is sometimes in probiotics and in probiotic milk, things like kefir. So it might have, I can look back and see, it might have been one that was in that strain that was tested in the, in the one that helped constipation. Um, but other than that, I'm not familiar with it in particular helping symptoms of Parkinson's. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, Kevin, you had your hand up. You have to unmute yourself. Kevin Dunn, you have to unmute yourself so we can hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. This is slightly off point, but urinary incontinence and the use of acupuncture. Have you done any work on that? No, I can't say I have. Um, no, there are other types of treatments for urinary incontinence or for urinary urgency. Um, you know, like, like peripheral nerve stimulation. Um, but I don't, 
I don't know of any with acupuncture in particular or no, I haven't done any work on that. Well, I'm in one, so. <laughs> okay. It's not working. <laughs> okay. I will say we do have your, I don't know if you're, we, you know, there are urologists that maybe don't focus in Parkinson's, but are certainly very familiar with Parkinson's and may be, you know, aware of particular procedures that um, may be helpful for people with Parkinson's. And you're, how do we get, would somebody, do we need it to be flashed up? How do we get into your clinical trials? Or is that already on the screen? It's in the slides, probably my, um, uh, what we'll do is we're going to post a video of this whole presentation on our uh, on our YouTube channel, which is, by the way, a good reminder for people to subscribe. That way, as soon as the video is uploaded, which will be within 48 hours, probably 24 hours, it'll be available to you. We'll then also post links to Dr. Brown's slides so that you can look at them. And in addition, uh, regarding the follow-up studies that Dr. Brown has talked about that are being done at UCSF, we'll create a place on our website where you can easily access and sign up for the Topaz study or the intestinal uh, bacteria study in, uh, that uh, Dr. Brown is doing now or other kinds of studies. So we'll try to make it accessible for you and everyone else via our website and via our YouTube channel. And Great. folks, this brings us to uh, the concluding part of our presentation. Uh, oh, thank you. You know, uh, Dr. Brown, it's been a fabulous presentation. I want to thank you. I'm sure people will have questions. Can they email uh, Danilo Romero, who's the research study coordinator with follow-up questions? Sure, yeah. Uh, you can email Danilo and he, if there are any, they can forward it to me or forward you to the appropriate person if you have questions. If he's right here. I didn't realize you were here, Danilo. Hello. Hi. Yeah, hi. Great presentation. Yeah. Um, I didn't really get a chance to, to introduce myself. Hi, I'm Danilo Romero. I'm sort of the, the Sherpa you, on the micro, micro PD trial. Um, so if you have any questions, you can email me. I also posted my phone number in the chat. So if you're wanting to uh, give me a call, we can call and chat about the various studies. Um, I'm pretty familiar with uh, all the trials happening in our clinic, so I can sort of triage you along to the variety of trials and that you're interested in hearing more about. Okay, well, thank you very, very much. All right, thanks for having us.